Well, hello everyone, and welcome to your lecture on the urinary system. We'll be talking about the organs of the urinary system, including the kidneys, the ureters, bladder, and urethra, and also the function of the urinary system, which is to be able to maintain fluid homeostasis by maintaining the normal volumes of blood and urine and composition of your fluid reservoirs, but mainly it's about maintaining your blood homeostasis. Um, we have a specialized branch of medicine that's going to deal specifically with diseases of the female and male reproductive and urinary systems. Uh, and that's going to be known as nephrology. And also we have a specialized branch of surgery related to um, the male and reproductive systems called urology as well. So let's talk about the urinary system. So the majority of the work is done by the kidneys. Here we're seeing here the left and the right kidney. You can see that's going to be found here near your abdominal aorta and uh, the vena cava. We also are going to have these ureters here which are going to drain into the urinary bladder. This here is a female so we can also see the reproductive system here with her ovaries. Um, so what we're going to talk about first is going to be these kidneys here. So the point of the kidney, right, the function of the kidney is to be able to regulate the ions in the blood, specifically calcium, potassium, and chlorine, and also to regulate blood pH. So that's going to include the bicarbonate buffer system, so the regulation of the hydrogen ions and the bicarbonates. Also the regulation of the volume of our blood, including the water in our system, and regulation of blood pressure, which is obviously directly related to the amount of water in the system. Also, we're going to talk about osmolarity here. So I know we talked about osmolarity previously, but here we're going to talk about it extensively, particularly when we talk about the concentrating role of the kidneys and then concentrating the urine. We'll get there in just a minute. Um, the kidneys also are going to be producing hormones like calcitriol and erythropoietin, which are going to be involved in the creation of um, blood cells. We also are going to be regulating the sugars in the blood. So regulation of blood glucose is very important. And last but not least, very important is going to be excretion of any of the metabolic waste or toxins that we may have in our system. So where are the kidneys located? So they're going to be located at the midsection or around the lower ribs, so they're partially protected by the lower ribs. They're going to be found towards your back here, so here's your right kidney um, and your left kidney, and then in the front is going to be all of your major organs, your stomach, your pancreas, your intestines, etc. So here's your abdominal aorta, just to kind of orient you. A um, little bit of renal anatomy, this area here is called the hilum. This is where the renal artery comes in, the renal vein comes out. Also where the ureter, which is where urine is going to be secreted, is going to come out. We're going to have a lot of nervous tissue here and also some lymphatic tissue as well. Um, so for the purposes of the diagrams going forward, you're going to see the urine structure is shown in yellow, so the urine collecting ducts and the bladder, etc. Um, but you're also going to see, you're going to continue to see the nervous system also shown in yellow, so make sure that you don't confuse the two as we go forward. Just an overview, so as we're going from the superficial to the deep, we're going to start with the renal fa fascia that's going to be on the outside, anchoring the kidneys to other surrounding structures. Just underneath that, we're going to have an adipose capsule, a little bit of fat tissue that's going to help protect and also anchor it down. And then underneath that, the renal capsule, which is going to connect directly to the ureter. Um, if we are looking at the kidney itself, the outer layer is going to be the cortex and the inner layer, the medulla. We've seen this previously and we'll see this again when we talk about the testes. So this is just general um, anatomical descriptions. But inside the kidneys we have something unusual. These are the renal pyramids. And these are going to have um, the region where the tubules are going to go in and we're going to be actually secreting the urine into the ureters. Um, and then the renal columns are going to go in between the renal pyramids and that's going to help anchor everything to the external region, the cortex, right? That outer layer. So this is what that looks like. Here we have the renal cortex that's going to surround the whole thing. Around that we have the renal capsule that's going to be here. We also are going to have this renal medulla section which are going to be um, going to be comprised of these renal pyramids. And surrounding the renal pyramids we also have renal columns which are going to directly connect us to the renal cortex. Right? This here is the calyx. We'll talk about that in just a second. So this entire section, as we just talked about, is going to be the renal cortex leading into the medulla. This section here is a renal lobe. A renal lobe is going to be comprised of a section of the cortex and then also the pyramid itself. And at the bottom of that renal lobe, we're also going to be connecting into the calyx. So the calyx is going to be where we are collecting our urine. 
Here we have nephrons, and we'll get into the nephron anatomy in just a second. The nephron is going to be a region where we are going to be concentrating the urine before it comes into the first the minor and then the major calyx and then out to the ureter to be stored and collected in the urinary bladder. Additionally, you'll notice here we have the renal veins coming in. Um, sorry, rain, veins are blue, I apologize. The renal veins coming in, um, the arteries coming in as well. We have a lot of vasculature here as well because part of what's happening is when we are concentrating the urine, we're also picking back up that water to be resorbed back into our bloodstream. So kidneys actually have quite a lot of blood supply, as I just mentioned. So they're only going to be less than 1% of your body mass, about 0.5% of your total body mass, but they get about 20 to 25% of your resting cardiac output. So that means that they're going to be um, getting a lot more circulation than some of the other organs in the body. We also have a lot of nerves. We have the renal nerves that are going to carry sympathetic outflow. So um, renal, they're also going to help regulate the amount of blood flow through the kidneys. So the kidneys are going to be very susceptible to the sympathetic and parasympathetic impulses. And we'll talk about that in a second. Um, all right. So the nephron that we just talked about previously is going to be a region where we are concentrating the urine. And it's going to start going through the renal cortex. It's going to dip into the renal medulla and then come back out to the cortex and then head in through the collecting duct out into the minor calyx. During this time frame, and we'll talk much more extensively about what actually is happening physiologically, but during this time frame, we're going to be accumulating water out of um, uh, into the blood supply, and we're also going to be picking up essential ions, things like calcium um, and chlorine and sodium, potassium. Um, so the flow of the fluid is actually going to go first through what we call a little Bowman's capsule, and you can see that right here. This is the glomerulus. The glomerulus is going to be the blood supply. It's going to be hidden inside. It's tucked inside this Bowman's capsule, so we have a cross-section here, and this is where we're going to have a lot of exchange back and forth. Um, of fluid. So first it's going to go through that glomerular capsule, then it's going to go through the proximal convoluted tubule, then it's going to head into this descending limb here of the nephron loop. Now the descending limb is going to then dip into the renal medulla before it becomes the ascending limb. We'll talk about osmolarity here in just a little while, but the osmolarity is going to change as we're traveling through here. So then as we're actually headed back up, we're going to be having a lot of water exported out, particularly in the presence of ADH or antidiuretic hormone. Again, that's going to be part of the sympathetic sympathetic responses. Um, and then after we get through that, we're going to head out through these um, into the distal convoluted tubule down into the collecting duct or into the minor calyx where it's going to be collected in urine, collected as urine. Um, all right. So the glomerulus that we just talked about is going to be a region that has a lot of capillaries. It's a little capillary bed that's tucked inside this Bowman's capsule. And Bowman's capsule has a layer of what are called podocytes. And podocytes are going to wrap around those capillaries. Podocytes are going to um, basically have a little bit of a region where filtration can occur. And the glomerulus, glomerulus apologize, is this mass of capillaries tucked inside that Bowman's capsule. And it's fed by, just like everything, afferent feeds in, afferent feeds out. So the afferent arterial feeds in and it drains out to the afferent arterial. And this whole purpose is going to be glomerular filtration. We'll talk extensively about glomerular filtration rates a couple slides down the way. Um, but we have these specialized cells called mesangial cells. They're contractile, and they're going to help regulate the filtration rate. Um, so this Bowman's capsule, the glomerular capsule, which wraps around the glomerulus, um, has this layer of what are called podocytes, right? These specialized cells that wrap around the capillaries. And they're going to allow filtration to occur, and the filtrate's going to be collected between these two layers, the visceral layer and the parietal layer. So what does that look like? Okay, so here is the renal corpuscule as a whole thing. Um, this outer part is going to be the Bowman's capsule, right? The Bowman's capsule is going to be surrounded by the glomerulus, which is going to be inside here. And then the glomerulus has these specialized cells, these mesangial cells. You can see um, they're inside here. And it also has specialized podocytes, which have these fenestrations, and they actually have specialized regions called pedicels, and pedicels are going to have little spaces or gaps in between here. So in this way, basically, the blood is going to get filtered. So it's going to go through here into the afferent arterial. It's going to get filtered through this glomerulus, whereby things are going to be allowed out through these fenestrations into this Bowman's capsule here. 
and then out through the into the convoluted tubule. And then the blood supply is going to end up leaving back out through the afferent arterioles. So you're actually going to see um, things both from the perspective of the blood supply and also from the perspective of the ur urinary tract in both of those slides and several of the slides coming up. Um, so the endothelial cells inside this glomerular apparatus are going to have these very large pores, these fenestrations, as we've seen previously, and that makes them leaky, right? And so that's going to allow things to flow out. Um, we also have a region, the basal lamina region, that lies between the podocytes and that endo endothelial layer, and they form those pedicels, which I just mentioned here, which have these little slits in them, and that's going to allow things to come out, and it's going to end up caught here in this capsular um, space. Okay. So if we are actually going to take a little cross-section here of these podocytes, so this is a podocyte here, it's going to be wrapping around with these little, has these pedicels here, has filtration slits, so things are going to be allowed through. Um, underneath that, we have a little slit membrane here, which is going to only allow very small things through. So we're not going to allow larger proteins or medium-sized proteins through because of the basal lamina and the slit membrane, but the very small things are going to be able to get through. Um, and we also, at the very bottom here, have these little fenestrations or pores in the endothelial cells themselves that line this glomerulus. Um, that's going to prevent the filtration of very large things like blood cells, but it's going to allow blood plasma to pass through. So in this way, the blood plasma can come out and things can get filtered through it, kind of like a cheesecloth, to allow all of that to head out, right? Then whatever re is retained in the blood will go back through um, and continue on its merry way through the circulatory system. Um, all right, so what, what happens to the filtrate? So whatever comes through that glomerular filtration um, is going to pass through the glomerular capsule into the renal tubule and that's this guy here so the renal tubule here is depicted in yellow so here we have the proximal convoluted tubule so it's going to come here directly from the, the filtrate comes directly from the Bowman's capsule into this proximal convoluted tubule and it's going to twist a little bit and then end up in the nephron loop now the nephron loop has two regions the descending region and the ascending region right um, and they're basically going to be passing through the cortex into the medulla and then back up into the cortex again and this is important because we're going to have osmol um, changes in the osmolarity as we head down and then back up and that's going to allow things to pass through in certain sections of these nephron loops after we pass through the descending and then the ascending loop of the nephron, then we're going to end up here in the distal convoluted tubule. That's going to end up heading out um, and then down into the collecting ducts. And then you can kind of see what I was talking about with the blood supply here. We have the afferent um, arterial headed in. Then we have glomerular filtration. Liquid's going to flow out. Whatever doesn't flow out and maintains in the blood supply, like the blood cells and the large proteins, is going to head out through the efferent arterial. So you see we have a lot of blood supply linking here as well. Um, all right, so this ascending loop of the juxtaglomerular apparatus is going to be connecting the afferent arterial at the macula densa. So that's here, right? The afferent arterial is going to be connected here um, into this Bowman's capsule. Um, and the wall of that arterial is going to be smooth muscle cells. These are going to be called juxtaglomerular cells. Um, and this whole apparatus is going to regulate the, both the pressure of the blood and also um, the amount of urination that you're going to have as well. Um, and that's all going to happen in conjunction with the autonomic, autonomic nervous system. So as I mentioned previously, the parasympathetic and sympathetic responses are going to be very important here. Uh, we already showed you that. Um, okay, so we are going to have receptors for ADH and aldosterone, and these are going to be responsive, again, to the sympathetic and parasympathetic responses. And then we also have specialized cells that are intercalated cells that are going to help manage the pH of the blood as this whole thing is occurring. All right, we have two different types of nephrons. The first are cortical nephrons. Cortical nephrons are going to be found in the cortex. Obviously, that's most of them. Approximately 80 to 85% of the nephrons are going to be found um, in the renal corpuscule in the outer portion of the cortex. And these guys are going to have short loops of Henle. So the ones that I just showed you are going to be the short ones, and they're extending only into the outer region of the medulla, so they don't go very deep. Um, and they're going to create urine that has similar osmolarity to your blood. Um, however, we also have much longer ones, and we'll talk about those in a little bit, so long loops of Henle. Um, so we also have these renal corpuscules that go deep into the cortex that have long nephron loops. 
Um, these are going to get their blood from paratubular capillaries, also from an area of the vasa recta, and they have two different sections of the ascending limb. So previously we just talked about ascending and descending, but now the descending limb, again coming down, is going to be feeding into the ascending limb, which has two separate regions, a thick region and a thin region, and this is going to allow us to secrete very concentrated urine, especially in times of low water supply. So what we mentioned previously were going to be the cortical nephrons, so the nephrons that are going to extend only partially into the rena medulla and then head back up. Again, in this case, both the ascending and the descending limbs are going to be approximately the same size. There's no major difference. However, and we already talked about the flow of the fluid through there. Again, it's going to go through the Bowman's capsule into the convoluted tubule, right down into the descending limb, up into the ascending limb, and then out through the distal convoluted tubule draining into the collecting duct here. Now, the juxtamedullary nephrons, however, are a little bit deeper. So here, they're still going to go through that glomerular or the capsule, the Bowman's capsule, right? They're still going to have the filtration occur. They're still going to go um, into the proximal convoluted tubule and then down into the descending limb. However, this descending limb goes much further, and this is where it changes. That ascending limb coming back up is going to have a thin section and then a thick section. And this is going to be relative to the osmolarity and the osmotic pressure that we're going to be seeing at the different regions. It's going to increase as we go downwards. So the deeper that you go, the higher that pressure is going to occur and then as we head back up um, we're going to so we'll have maintained pressure we're going to increase in osmolarity as we go down similar to our surrounding environment but then as we come back up um, we are actually going to be much lower than our surrounding environment and that's going to allow things like water and etc to flow in and well, to flow out actually and we're also going to talk about the flow of ions such as sodium and chlorine and potassium in just a little bit as well but I just wanted to demonstrate the major differences between the cortical and the juxtamodulary um, nephrons. So here as we head back up after that it all is going to basically remain the same. Then we're going to head back out into the um, distal convoluted tubule and drain back into that collecting duct into the calyx. All right. So here's what we're basically seeing inside that glomerular capsule, right? First we have the ar afferent arterial, which is going to be feeding in our blood supply. Things are going to be leaking across to those fenestrations into that glomerular capsule itself, the Bowman's capsule. And then that filtrate is going to end up in this renal tube that goes out into the urine eventually after we concentrate it. Um, anything that isn't going to leak out is going to head out through that afferent arterial and then go on about its merry way into the... Um, into the rest of circulation, but before it does so, it's going to be picking up things that are going to be filtrated out across the, um, the from the glomerular filtrate in the renal tube. Um, things are going to be leaving and picked up by the capillaries, so that's called tubular resorption. And then also we're going to have things secreted from the blood into the fluid, which can then possibly get picked up in the urine. So the total excretion is going to be equal to the glomula glomerular filtration rate plus the amount that is secreted minus the amount, this part here, plus the amount that's secreted minus the amount that is resorbed. That's going to be the amount that's actually going to head out into the urine. And all of this is going to be driven by blood pressure. Um, and so we have multiple different sets of fluid pressure that we're going to be talking about here. So we have the capsular hydrostatic pressure, so the pressure inside the capsule, and then also the blood colloid osmotic pressure, so the pressure inside the capillary itself. Um, and that's going to allow things like water and small molecules to move um, out of the glomerulus and into the Bowman's capsule. In fact, a lot of water is going to head out through that global um, glomerular filtration. Approximately 150 to 180 liters of water pass out um, into that glomerular capsule. And don't worry, almost all of that is going to get resorbed. So no, you don't have to drink 150 liters of water in a day. Um, I'm joking, don't try that, you'll get sick. Um, anyway, so the glomerular filtration rate is going to be equal to the amount of filtrate that's formed by both of your kidneys per minute. Um, and again, we're going to come back to homeostasis here in order to have a regular homeostatic conditions. You're going to need your kidneys to maintain a constant glomerular filtration rate. Um, and this has to be dialed in, right? If it's too high, substances are going to pass through too quickly and are not going to get reabsorbed. You're going to be excreted out. Um, things that should be resorbed are going to be excreted out. And if this is too low, we're going to be resorbing everything, including some waste products that we might want to be um, excreting. So we're not going to be adequately excreting things if we have a lower glomerular filtration rate. Um, okay, so there's a lot of numbers on here, and again, I'm not going to ask you to do any math. Basically, what you're going to be looking for is, is it higher or is it lower? Um, and things obviously are going to be going from high pressure to low pressure. So if we're coming in at 55, and this outer pressure here is only about, um, about 15, we're going to be headed out, right? So we have pressure that's coming from the 
blood, this hydrostatic pressure coming in. We have pressure that's the osmotic pressure that's pushing backwards, and then that capsular pressure. And so basically the net filtration rate is going to be this hydrostatic pressure of coming in minus the pressures that are pushing back upon it. So if those numbers are 55, 15, and 30, then our overall filtration rate is going to be 10. The filtration pressure, I apologize, is going to be 10. Again, I'm not going to ask you to do that math. I just want you to understand that we have different pressures from different regions, and the higher the pressure compared, comparative to the region it's pushing against, then the faster the flow rate is going to occur. Um, and this is going to differ for male and females. It's obviously a little bit higher in males, so our glomerular filtration rate in males is going to be approximately 125 milliliters per minute, and in females, 105 milliliters per minute. Again, I'm not going to ask you to memorize this, but I do want you to recognize that this is an awful lot of fluid that is flowing th through our kidneys at any given moment. Um, and there's going to be controlled by a lot of different things, just like all of our negative feedback loops. It's going to be auto-regulated by, uh, we have renal auto-regulation loops, we have neural regulation loops, um, and then hormonal regulation as well. So how does this work? What's our, what are our regulation pathways? So we have regulation that happens through the smooth muscle cells. It's called myogenic mechanism. And in this mechanism, the smooth muscle cells are going to contract when the blood pressure increases. And so when we get an elevated blood pressure, we're going to have contraction, and that's going to increase. Um, and we also have tubular glomerular feedback. And basically, if we have a really high filtration rate, that's going to decrease our resorption rate, right? Um, and so we want to constrict our afferent arterioles, and they're going to do that by inhibiting the release of nitric oxide. And nitric oxide is a vasodilator, so um, if we're releasing less of that, we're going to have constriction of the arterioles. So that looks kind of like this. So just like all of our feedback loops, we're going to start with a stimulus that's going to disrupt whatever our homeostasis is. So something happens that in this case is going to disrupt our homeostatic condition, which is glomerular filtration rate. So uh, that's going to be read by the receptors that are right next to the juxtaglomerular apparatus, which is in the macula densa region here. They're, they're going to detect um, an increased delivery of the ions of sodium and chloride and also water. And that's going to have an output, which is going to decrease, in this case, the decretion of nitric oxide. Again, that's going to cause vasoconstriction. Um, vasoconstriction is going to decrease blood flow. If we have a decrease in blood flow, we have now adequately um, addressed our increase in filtration rate, right? And so that's going to return us back to homeostasis. And it's going to continue to do this until we've reached homeostatic conditions that are adequate. Um, and as I mentioned previously, we're going to have a lot of neural regulation here. So there's a lot of nerves coming in, lots of sympathetic fibers. Um, these guys are going to be very responsive to the sympathetic autonomic nervous system. Um, and if we have strong stimulation, something like exercise or severe hemorrhage, for example, we're going to constrict the afferent arterioles because if we do this, we're going to want to conserve our water, right? That's going to reduce our urine output. And that means that we're going to have blood available for other organs that might need them, like our muscles and fight or flight. Um, we also have some hormones that we're going to talk about here. We talk about angiotensin II um, and also ANP. We've heard about ANP before. Um, angiotensin II is going to constrict the afferent and the efferent capillaries, which is going to diminish the filtration rate because we have less pressure coming um, we have less going in, so therefore we have less going through. Um, we also are going to have AMP. AMP is going to have a response by the mesangial cells, which is going to increase their surface area, which is going to therefore increase their filtration rates. Um, and AMP is going to be secreted when we have a stretch in the cardiac atria. Remember, we have little barrel pressures inside the atria. And so when we have the stretch receptors and the barrel receptors and the cardiac atria increasing, we're going to then secrete ANP which is going to increase our GFR, glomerular filtration rate. Um, most of our filtrate is resorbed, as I mentioned. Most of it is going to end up back into our blood supply, especially things like water, glucose, amino acids, and ions. So if there is sugar in your urine, there is generally going to be an issue or a problem. Um, in fact, that's one of the things when we talk about urinalysis that we do not expect to find in our urine. And so the secretion of some things is going to help manage the pH, of the urine and also help getting rid of toxic and foreign substances inside the body. So we want to be excreting waste through this method as well. 
And again, you're going to see a lot of numbers here. I don't expect you to have to memorize any of these numbers, but what I want you to look at is the amount that's going to be found in the plasma and then versus the amount that's found in the urine. Um, and then, for example, in glucose, we're going to find three grams in our plasma, in our blood plasma, but we wouldn't expect to find any in our urine. Why? Because although we find it in the filtrate, 162 grams go in, 162 grams are also resorbed right? And almost the same thing for water, right? And we have 180 that are going to go through and filtrate per day, 180 liters. Fathom that. That's a lot of liquid. Um, but 178 to 179 of it is going to be resorbed and we're going to be excreting approximately one to two liters in your urine per day. Um, the protein, we're going to secrete a very, very minimal amount, um, but if you look at with 200 grams in the plasma compared to 0.1 grams in the urine, not very much is going to get through. Some does end up in the filtrate. Again, you're often going to see it. In fact, all of these are going to see it in the filtrate, but you're going to see most of it resorbed. Now, other things, however, like creatinine, which is not something that your body wants to have, all 1.6 grams that are going to end up taken out in the filtrate are going to end up... Um, excreted in the urine. None of them are going to get resorbed into the blood and in this way we're going to be getting rid of things that are considered cellular waste or toxins. Okay, so again I don't expect you to memorize any of the numbers on here. I want you to understand what we keep and what passes through. So we resorb our sugars, we resorb most of our proteins, right? We resorb about half of our urea. We resorb none of our creatinine, right? So certain things are expected to be found in the urine, but much lower in the plasma. Other things are expected to be found in high levels in the plasma and much lo lower in the urine. And that I do expect you guys to understand. All right. So there's a couple of ways that this filtrate can be resorbed. It can be resorbed by active processes and passive processes. This can include things like water glucose, amino acids, and ions, almost all of that is going to get resorbed back into your blood supply. Um, but we're also going to be helping to manage the pH and again rid the body of those toxic and foreign substances. So two different methods of resorption. Pra paracellular resorption basically means the, leak, the fluid is going to leak um, between the cells and transcellular resorption means it's going to go directly through and then across the tubule cells. And so here, this is the paracellular resorption. It's going to go right in between, sneaky, sneaky style. And then can go straight into the interstitial fluid and then eventually make its way into the paratubular capillaries. This is going to be by way of diffusion, so no energy is required for this. However, we also have transcellular resorption, whereby it's going to go across the cell and then be secreted out of the cell on the other side, again, into the interstitial fluid, where it can be um, picked up by the paratubular capillaries. But because it has to go across the membrane, and then it has to be excreted across the membrane again. This particular excretion is going to cost energy. So this is active transport. You can see we have an ATP molecule down being broken down into ADP. That release of energy is going to be used to drive the transport of sodium across that membrane. Um, and that's going to be done through a sodium potassium pump. And again, it's going to use an ATPase, so that's going to cost energy. So paracellular resorption, free to the cell in terms of energy cost. It's going to be diffusion. Transcellular resorption costs the cell money in terms of energy. Um, so primary active transport is going to cost energy. It uses ATP just like the sodium potassium pumps um, and it's going to be approximately 6% of the total body ATP use when you're laying on the couch doing nothing. Um, we also have secondary active transport. That's going to be driven by electrochemical gradients, different ions from one direction to the other. Um, we have things called symporters and things called antiporters. As you might imagine, symporters are going to take two substances and move them in the same direction. Antiporters are basically going to be swapping, so one goes from one side to the membrane to the other, and a different molecule goes the opposite direction. So symporters are going to move two substances in the same direction. Antiporters are going to be move A from one side to the other and B from the opposite direction. We also are going to talk about the resorption of water. Um, so water has a couple of different ways that it's picked up. One is called obligatory water resorption, and this we don't, we can't really control. Um, water is going to follow whatever solutes are being reabsorbed because we're trying to reach homeostasis for the water as well, right? We want to reach equilibrium. But we also have a special, a small subset of that water, that 10%, that can be regulated by hormones like antidiuretic hormone, and that's called um, facultative water resorption and that 10% although it doesn't seem like a lot actually accounts for the difference between when we have very concentrated and very dilute urine because it's all going to be regulated by antidiuretic hormone. Um, and antidiuretic hormone obviously is going to increase water resorption. So 
we have specialized types of symporters and antiporters. So we have sodium glucose symporters. That means that sodium and glucose are going to be headed in the same direction. And then we have sodium and hydrogen antiporters, where we're basically trading them one for one. Um, we also have aquaporin one, and as you see the word aqua right in there, and porin mean a pore. So we have a membrane protein that's going to allow water straight through. These are basically going to be water channels. They're going to be allowing specifically only water to diffuse through the membrane. Okay, so this is showing you several different types of transport mechanisms. On the left, we have a symporter. On the right, we have two antiporters. Um, the symporter here on the left is the sodium glucose symporter. It's shown in blue. And basically what happens is when we bring in sodium, we also are going to bring in glucose. All right? Um, and then sodium is going to, at the cost of cellular energy, get transported across the sodium potassium pump into this interstitial fluid, again, to be picked up by the paratubular capillaries, and then back into the blood supply. Glucose, on the other hand, is going to go by um, facilitated diffusion, so we're not going to actually cost any energy, but it is going to need assistance. That's depicted here by this diffusion transport molecule in green that's going to snap around either side of glucose and then send it to the other side of the membrane. This does not cost energy, but remember that sodium does, so it still overall costs the cell energy, and that is going to then get picked up just like the sodium by the paratubular capillary and then back into the blood supply. Okay, on the right here we have antiporters. There are two of them. Um, this one here is basically showing how we are going to be resorbing sodium and secreting hydrogen ions. And then in the second picture, we're um, going to be showing the reabsorption of a molecule that's going to be part of the bicarbonate system, um, so HCO3 negative. And basically in both cases... When we have one going in, we have one going out. So here we have sodium coming in. Here we have hydrogen going out. Again, once sodium comes in, sodium is going to go straight through that sodium potassium pump. And again, that's going to cost the cell energy. Again, the sodium is going to get picked up. So all of this is going to result in the sodium ending up back into the blood supply. But sometimes it's a lot more simple and other times it's a lot more complicated, right? Um, you'll also see here this H2CO3, that's going to be a bicarbonate molecule. That's going to be part of what happens here. Um, when we are bringing in the sodium and bringing out the hydrogen, we are also going to be resorbing this H2, HCO3 molecule that's going to be binding immediately with the hydrogen and then breaking down into water and CO2 and it's just going to be a complete cycle here. So during this mechanism, basically what's happening multiple different ways. We have sodium coming across the membrane, across the cell, and then into the capillaries. Same thing's happening here, right? It's going to be coming in, except in this case, it's coming in as hydrogen is leaving, whereas in this case, it's coming in as glucose as is also coming in, and glucose is also getting picked up. Um, and then additionally, down here, when we are picking up that hydrogen ion that's coming across, right, that's also depicted here, it's then going to get matched with the HCO2 negative molecule to turn into water and carbon dioxide. That carbon dioxide is just going to do this, this recycle. So in this wet method, we're going to be able to get sodium across, and the hydrogen is just going to kind of cycle. And that's the difference between symporters and antiporters, and also ties into how we are resorbing our major um, ions back into our blood supply. All right. So some of the other things that are going to be resorbed are going to include things like calcium, magnesium, urea, right, potassium, chlorine, um, and these are all going to be able to go either by diffusion, again it can head right on through here, or we can go across, and then water can do the same thing, it can go through right on through those junctions, or it can go across the cells as well, and all of that is going to end up back into the peritubular capillary and resorbed by the blood supply. So this is stuff that we're not going to, we're going to try anyway, um, to keep out of the urine. All right, so that loop of Henle is actually going to be relatively impermeable to water, especially in that ASINU region. We have very little obligatory water resorption here. Basically what's happening right here is we are resorbing sodium, potassium, and chlorine. And then after that, the water will follow. All right, um, here we are talking, you see we're talking here about the ascending nephron loop where we've gotten thicker, so we're in the thicker region. And here we're going to also be doing kind of the same thing. We're going to be picking up sodium. Again, we're going to need to do the sodium potassium pump to get it across. That's going to cost energy. And then go into the blood supply. Um, additionally, we're going to be bringing in potassium and we're going to be bringing in chlorine. And all of these... Uh, well, particularly the chlorine. The chlorine is going to end up also in the blood supply. The potassium is just going to kind of lather, rinse, repeat in and out. It's going to head out by diffusion and then get brought in through the pump and then head out from the diffusion and then get brought out by the pump. 
Um, and again, a lot of these are going to be able to go straight through this membrane, um, but water is not going to be able to go through that membrane. Um, and this is going to help us maintain our osmolarity, which we'll talk about in a second here. And in this case, that means that our interstitial fluid is actually going to be more negative in terms of our charge than the fluid inside here. So what are we doing? We're going to be able to pull our negative, uh, we're going to be able to pull our charges across because we have a, a difference in the charge here and the charges there. Um, so these sodium and chloride supporters are going to be responsible for resorbing the ions. Um, we also have a parathyroid hormone, which is going to help stimulate the resorption of calcium. We talked about that when we talked about um, thyroids. But it's going to help stimulate the resorption of calcium, which again is going to end up in our bones. It's also going to inhibit the resorption of phosphate in the proximal convoluted tubule, which is going to enhance its ex excretion. So if it's not going to get resorbed, it's going to head out in with the urine. So we're going to have a like, higher likelihood of phosphate headed out in the excreted fluids. Um, all right, two major types of cells in those regions in the late distal convoluted tubule and the collecting duct are going to include the principal cells. These are going to have sodium potassium pumps that are going to be responsible for resorbing the sodium. Again, that potassium is just going to head out by diffusion and then back in through the pump over and over. We also have aquaporin too, which is responsible for water resorption and also going to help be stimulated by antidiuretic hormone. Additionally, we have intercalated cells. These intercalated cells are going to resorb that um, potassium that we talked about and HCO3 as well. They're also going to be secreting hydrogen ions. So a lot of different things are going back and forth across this membrane to help concentrate our urine. Okay, so here we're going to have a disruption of homeostatic conditions. In this case, the condition is going to be the osmolarity of the plasma and the interstitial fluid. So if we have a change in the osmolarity, we have receptors that detect that change in osmolarity, and those are called osmoreceptors. They're going to be found in the hypothalamus. So they detect that change that's going to send nerve impulses um, out in the, in the form of the release of ADH. So if we increase the release of antidiuretic hormone, that's going to go directly to our effector cells, which in this case are the principal cells, to make them more permeable to water. Remember previously they weren't very permeable to water. When they become permeable to water, that's going to increase the amount of water that's picked up, right? Increase the water resorption, which is going to decrease our plasma osmolarity, right? And we're also going to be increasing the concentration of things in our urine as well. So decreasing the water content of the urine. And that's going to return us to homeostasis once our plasma osmolarity returns back to normal because we've increased the amount of water coming in. And now all of a sudden we've changed the plasma osmolarity back to whatever we initially had and we've reached our homeostatic condition. Um, Okay, so urine production has to be able to be flexible because fluid intake is highly variable. There are some days that you drink a lot more water than others, and there's also some days where you, for example, sweat more than others or exercise more than others, and so your metabolism is going to increase and decrease as well. So the amount of fluid both inside your body and inside your particular cells is going to be variable at any given moment. But we want to try to regulate that. Right? And so we want to have homeostatic conditions that's going to regulate the maintenance of those fluid volumes within those specific limits or parameters. And we do that by concentrating your urine. So we're able to increase or decrease the urine concentration by increasing or decreasing the amount of antidiuretic hormone that's circulating through our body. Right? Um, if we have a high intake of liquid, we're going to have diluted urine with lots of volume, right? If we have a low intake of liquid, we'll have concentrated urine of low volume. And you guys will actually see that when you do your lab. Basically what will happen is you will have an initial urine sample and we'll be testing it for all sorts of things, including its concentration. Um, and you also look at the color, which will get lighter as you go through. And then that individual will then drink a liter of water and then urinate every 20 minutes throughout the rest of the lab. And we'll take samples then take a look at the pH of that urine, which will dilute out concentration of salt in that urine, which will dilute out, and then the increase of the volume of the urine, obviously, because you put more water in. Um, so if you have less intake, you're going to have more concentrated urine and high intake of water. You're going to have diluted urine. Um, it's going to be of higher volume. Now, the filtrate that comes through that glomerular apparatus and your blood are going to have the same osmolarity, approximately 300 milliosmoles per liter. Um, and the tubular osmolarity is going to change in the concentration gradient fashion as we head into the medulla. So when we go down that descending uh, part loop in the nephron, we're going to increase our osmolarity, and then as we head back up, it's going to decrease in osmolarity in the outside region. So um, as we are 
creating our urine, particularly formation of dilute urine. So this is going to be without the ADH. We're not going to need ADH because we're going to have lots of liquid in our system. Um, so when we're forming dilute urine, the osmolarity in the tubule is going to increase as we head downward through that descending limb, which is important because the surroundings are also increasing. So we're basically maintaining the same osmolarity as our surroundings as we descend. And then as we go up in the ascending limb, it's going to decrease and it's going to decrease a little bit faster than its surroundings. And so therefore things are going to be picked up by the surroundings and the interstitial fluid concentrating the urine. And as we head into the collecting duct, it's going to decrease even more. So what does that look like? Again, I don't need you to pay attention to the specifics of the numbers. I want you to look at the comparisons of the numbers. So I don't need you to remember that this is 300. I need you to say it's the same. It's the same. It's the same, right? So as we're heading down into the medulla, the osmolarity in the surrounding regions is going to decrease. And so therefore, we're also, I'm sorry, it's going to increase. It's going to increase as we head downward, I apologize. So we're here at 300, and then we're going to get down to about 900. It actually gets down to about 1,200 in the very deep regions. And then as we head back up, so as we head downward, we're going to be the same, 350, 550. So we're going to be increasing as we descend, same as our surroundings. So we're basically maintaining homeostasis comparing to our surroundings. But then as we head back upward, we're going to decrease in that descending limb and we're going um, in the ascending limb, decreasing in the ascending limb, and we're going to do it at a faster rate than the surroundings. So now all of a sudden 550 is lower than 750, 350 lower than 550, 150 lower than 350. So that means that things are going to be flowing outward in order to try to maintain homeostasis. And as we go through this collecting duct, um, we're actually going to end up with an even more of a, a decrease or a change, right? So because this is going to maintain around 90, 80, 70, it's actually going down. And the surroundings as we're heading through this are going to be going up. So the difference between 80 and 550 is very vast. And as we head downwards, 65 to 900 is even more vast. And that's how we're going to end up with very, very, very dilute urine, which should be approximately 65 in terms of osmolarity. Um, and so you can see that what's happening is the change in pressures of the surrounding, you have to match it as you head down, and then as you head back up, you are going to decrease your osmolarity faster than the surroundings such that things are going to flow out, and that's going to even increase more as we head into that collecting duct. So I do hope that I've done a decent job of explaining that, but don't worry, you'll see it again. Um, so as we head upward in that ascending limb, it's going to get thicker, and in that thick ascending limb, um, we're going to have those symporters that we talked about previously that are resorbing sodium, chlorine, um, potassium, and it's going to have a low water permeability until we have ADH, right? So this is dilute urine. We don't have ADH present, so we have a very low water permeability. So the solutes are all going to leave. The water stays in the tubule and eventually is going to leave out um, through the collecting duct and it's going to end up in the urine. So we'll have a low water permeability in the collecting duct as well because, again, we don't have ADH present. And that's the difference between dilute urine and concentrated urine. When we have concentrated urine, we have the presence of ADH. Um, and when we have the presence of ADH, then all of a sudden this region becomes water permeable and water can and come out um, and so then we're going to end up with more and more and more concentrated urine. All right, um, so in order to form that concentrated urine, we have specialized juxtamodulary nephrons. These are the ones with the very long loops um, and that's going to increase our osmotic gradient by something called the countercurrent multiplier and basically what this means is that as you are changing your pressure one direction, it's changing it the other direction so we're ending up with a much larger osmotic gradient um, basically we have solutes that are going to be pumped out in that ascending limb, but the water is going to stay inside that tubule and that's going to increase um, the modulary osmolarity. So the surrounding region's osmolarity is going to increase. So what does that look like? All right. So as I mentioned previously, as you head down into the renal medulla, the surroundings are going to have a increase in their osmotic pressure. So the osmotic gradient is going to start around 300 at the region where we have the cortex touching the medulla. As we head down through the medulla, we're going to get down to about 1200 here at the bottom. This bottom region, by the way, is called the loop of Henle. Right? So I'll just walk you through everything that we've already talked about just to orient you. So the blood. The blood's going to come in here through that afferent arteriole. Right? It's going to head into this glomerulus. Glomerulus is sitting inside the Bowman's capsule, also known as the glomerular capsule. And we're going to have glomerular filtration occurring. So the glomerular filtration, again, we can vary the rate based on certain things, but the glomerular filtration is going to come out here of the glomerulus and then head into the proximal convoluted tubule. Now, two things to keep in mind here, what's happening on the inside of this tube and also what's happening on the outside. I guess three things because we also later on will talk about blood. But right now we're just talking about the outside of the tubule is going to be increasing in osmotic gradient as we go down. 
sorry. Um, additionally, that means that as we're headed down here through the, cox, um, through the proximal convoluted tubule into the descending limb, we are also going to want to increase in osmotic pressure. And we're going to do that by having a bunch of water come out. So water is going to come out the entire way. And that means that we are going to basically be maintaining approximately, not exactly equal. You can see here we're at 380 and here it's 400. We're at 580 and this is 600. But we're really close to our surroundings. So therefore, we are going to be very similar on the inside and the outside. So while water is coming out as we're headed down, we're maintaining the same osmotic pressure on the inside and the outside. But now, as we pass the loop of Henley, come on, and we had our way back up, now here we are going to be um, in the thick region of the ascending tubule. Now all of a sudden we're going to have the sodium and chloride going to get transported out, right? Um, and we are going to be much, much lower than the surrounding. So here we're 400, our surrounding is 600. Here we're 200, our surrounding is 400. So in this way we are going to have a drastic osmotic gradient from what's inside the tubule versus what's outside the tubule. Remember, we did not see that as we were descending because we were maintaining approximately the same osmolarity as the inside as we had on the outside. Okay, so now we're going to hit the distal convoluted tubule and head into that collecting duct. As we head through that collecting duct again, we're going to have ADH present previously because we already have low water intake. We're making concentrated urine here. Um, and so when ADH is present, um, water is going to be coming right on out through that collecting duct, lots and lots and lots of it. And so as we head back down through the medulla, we're able to get to the same concentration as the uh, same osmotic gradient, right, as the lower part of the medulla. So now we're able to get concentrated urine approximately 1,200 osmolarity because we've sent it all the way down into the medulla before we have collected it into the calyx. So it's kind of a way in which we can trick the system in the presence of ADH into making sure that we have a very concentrated urine so we're able to maintain all of our water inside our blood. Um, additionally, what's happening in our blood supply, right? So here's our blood flow. It's headed through here. It's going to also do the same thing. It's going to start off at 300, and then as it goes down in that tubule, it's going to be de uh, secreting water because it's also going to be increasing in osmotic pressure to match its surroundings. So water comes out, water comes out, water comes out. Sodium and chlorine come in. Okay, well that's cool because sodium and chloride are going to be coming out from this side, right? So now they're going to be able to leave the urine and be picked up by the blood supply by the same osmotic gradient that was going to allow the urine to get concentrated. Right, so it's kind of a neat system. All right, so in the presence of ADH, or antidiuretic hormone, these collecting ducts are going to become permeable to water, so water's going to be able to secrete out. That's going to help us increase the concentration of the tubular fluid, so we're going to become very concentrated. Also going to carry um, urea into the medulla, which is going to help contribute to this osmolarity in the, the osmotic gradient. Right? Um, so a couple of things that we didn't talk about, this is basically the same image, but what we have not yet talked about here is the urea shown in four. Urea is going to be able to leave at this point, anywhere from like 900 down, so it's going to be leaving out and it's going to be building up in the renal medulla. Um, and that's also going to allow us to help have this lower osmotic gradient in this region. Okay. Um, but this is going to cost a lot of energy, right? They need nutrients and they need oxygen. So these specialized cells, the loop cells and the duct cells, are going to need a lot of nutrients and oxygen from the blood supply. We have specialized capillaries that feed them. These are called the vasa recta. And they form these little loops that are going to be similar to the nephron loops that you see in the medulla. Um, and that's going to allow us to feed these regions while maintaining the medulla concentration gradient, because as you saw, when the blood supply goes down into the medulla, it also is going to change its osmolarity. So incoming and outgoing blood is going to have similar osmolarity, but as you head down, it's going to match the osmolarity of those nephron loop regions. Um, so yeah, this is basically what they're saying. So the blood that's going to be feeding into them is going to be um, approximately the same as the renal medulla region surrounding it. So that's going to allow it to give blood supply to these cells without changing the osmotic gradient. Okay, so there's a lot of things that we can tell by looking at your urine, right, to be able to evaluate how well your kidneys are functioning. So we use something called urinalysis. We use this all the time. And it's going to help evaluate for the presence of certain things in the urine that ought not be there or the level of things that are supposed to be there but within certain concentrations. So things like albumin should not be present at all. Albumin is a protein. It should be kept in your blood supply. 
Um, glucose, same thing. Those are supposed to be things that are resorbed back into the blood and the capillaries. And so if they are not, there is something that's going wrong. Um, red blood cells, obviously always a bad problem if you have blood cells or blood particulates in your, um, in your urine. Also, ketone bodies can indicate that you have um, bad blood pH. And so you might be headed into acidosis. So that might be something that could be very worrisome for your provider. Also, microbes in, their, uh, in your urine indicates that you may have some sort of infection like a urinary tract infection, bladder infection, kidney infection, etc. So that's something that might want to lead to some antibiotics or some further, um, further evaluation. All right, so what happens to the urine after it leaves the kidneys? So they're going to be transported by what are called ureters. Ureters transport urine from the renal pelvis using peristaltic waves, hydrostatic pressure, and then also gravity. Um, and there's no actual anatomical valve that sits at the opening of the ureter. It basically has a backflow compression. So as soon as the bladder fills up, it compresses the opening, and that's going to prevent backflow from occurring. Um, the bladder is able to hold 700 to 800 milliliters of liquids. It's hollow, distensible, it's got tight junctions, it's actually a muscle, and it is going to be connected here um, to the regions, to so the back of the body, it's going to be connected to the peritoneum, here we go. Um, and we also are going to have regions here that are the sphincters, we have an external urethral sphincter, um, and then also an internal urethral um, sphincter here, and this is going to allow us to have voluntary control of our bladder. Um, we also have specialized muscles here. This is the detrusor muscle. It's going to be responsible for pushing urine um, during contraction into the urethra. And you'll also see here that we have the rugga or the mucosa. We've seen this previously in the stomach, right, for another distensible organ. It's going to allow extension of the urinary bladder so that as it fills up. Um, this region here is called the trigone region. It's basically going to connect the urethral openings into the internal urethral orifice, which is basically what's going to head into the urethra. And the urethra is going to be the passageway where we're going to be discharging urine from the body. Again, we have two sphincters that prevent the accidental discharge, an internal and an external um, urethra sphincter. And then this is the external urethra orifice, which is actually what's going to be allowing the opening of the urethra to the external environment. Um, the discharge of urine is called micturition. So I know the rest of the world uses urination, but we use micturition. Um, and micturition, again, the discharge of urine is going to be two different sets of contractions, voluntary and involuntary muscular contractions. Um, we have stretch receptors that trigger a spinal reflex, and this is something that as children we learn to control. And we also are going to have a region, again, the urethra, that's going to carry urine from the external uh, internal urethral orifice, I apologize there, to the exterior of the body. And this is also going to be the same organ, which in males is going to be used to discharge semen as well as urine. Um, so this is just talking about the male and female organs. So here are the urethras. You can see the the male urethra is going to head down here. This is the intermediate urethra, the prosthetic urethra, which is going to pass through the prostate gland. This is why many have prostate cancer or prostate issues when they get older. may have frequent urination problems or problems with being able to urinate because they have too much pressure there. It causes blockage. Um, anyway, this is the intermediate urethra, which is going to pass through the peritoneum. It's the very smallest segment. It's only this little bit. And then this is the um, spongy urethra. The spongy urethra passes through the penis itself. We'll talk about when we talk about male reproductive biology. Um, and and then this is going to be the external urethra orifice. Um, here in the female, here is the urinary bladder. It is going to head out through the urethra. You'll notice that urethra, that especially that external urethra, is much, much, much smaller. And we really just have one section of it, not multiple different sections. And then here's the external urethra orifice. Um, there are some major differences between males and females. The urethra in males is about approximately five times longer than in females and is also divided into three segments in males. But again, we only have one short tube in females. So again, for the males, one last time, the prostatic urethra is going to pass through the prostate gland. Um, and then here are the intermediate urethra and then the spongy urethra. Again, all of this is also going to secrete the male reproductive things. So we're going to end up with secretions from the prostate gland, from the vas deferens, etc. during the ejaculate as well. Um, all of that's going to come through the same urethra tube. Um, and again, in the male, okay, correct. It's going to be common duct for male um, reproductive and urinary systems. And then females are going to be entirely separate. So those are two of the major differences between the male and the female systems here. And I do believe that's brought us to the end of our lecture. So I appreciate you sticking with me, you guys. And I will chat with you next time about uh, reproduction.